source of life and cause of death, water can wash away clues, dilute evidence, and conceal corpses. For investigators, water can be a cunning opponent. For criminals, a most accommodating ally. For the perfect crime, just add water. notorious crimes in Canadian history. A crime so evil and chilling, it captivated the people of Southern Ontario for more than a year. This case is protected by the Youth Criminal Justice Act. The identities of the victim, the defendants, and the witnesses cannot be revealed. Mississauga, Ontario is a quiet Toronto suburb. On January 18, 2003 at 10.35 p.m., a 911 call is received at the Peel Regional District Call Centre. A distraught young girl tells the operator that her mother has drowned in the bathtub. The police and emergency response teams are dispatched to a house in a middle-class neighborhood. The two hysterical teenage sisters open the door. They point to the upstairs bathroom and tell the emergency personnel that their mother has drowned in the bathtub. The paramedics pull her body from the tub and attempt to resuscitate the mother but she is unresponsive. They cover her body with a sheet and leave it for the coroner to examine when he arrives. Yeah, right from the beginning, bathtub drownings don't occur very often, and so they have to be looked at with a degree of suspicion. So this was a suspicious death. I still have difficulty with believing that people drown in bathtubs on their own. I, I know it's possible to it, but I still have that mindset going in that until I prove it to myself, I don't believe it. Forensic identification officer Bernie Weber arrives at the house. His first task is to observe and photograph the scene. I actually arrived just shortly before the coroner. And so I go in, I photograph everything the way that I find it. I don't uh, touch anything, I don't move anything. Um, you know, I don't even take the blanket off of uh, the deceased. And I don't even want to get in to start moving anything until the coroner gives me that sort of authorization. I want him to see the scene the way that I have. We still didn't know exactly what we were dealing with. I did some photographs in other areas of the home, one which showed the living room where everything was relatively neat and tidy, but there was a vodka bottle which was lying on its side um, on the coffee table. While Weber continues his inventory of the scene, Inspector Brent Magnus begins his preliminary investigation. He will be the first person to record the sister's version of the events. They tell him they went to meet friends for dinner at Jack Astor's restaurant around 6 p.m. When they left, their mother was drinking heavily. When they returned around 10.30, they were shocked to find their mother unconscious, face down in the bathtub. During that uh, brief interview or uh, talking with the girls, they requested to go to the aunt's. She agreed that the girls could stay with uh, her, it was close by, and uh, it was uh, easy to take them to the place of safety. The girls are escorted to their aunt's house nearby. 
That scene uh, was initially identified as a sudden death scene, and the coroner would have responsibility over that particular scene. The coroner arrives. He and Bernie Weber begin to reconstruct the sequence of events. A uh, normal size between 5'2 and 5'5. Five five. She was slightly overweight. Whenever you start to move uh, a body and they talk about that dead weight, it would have been very difficult actually even just for her small size to try to get her out of the bathtub like the fire department did. Um, so for things not to be completely knocked over uh, within the bathroom wasn't a surprise. It was actually still relatively in order. So I was asked by the coroner to fingerprint her in order to identify her. I take a, a dark fingerprint powder on a brush. I uh, put the powder onto the skin itself. And then what I do is I put a piece of tape over top of that finger. And then as I pull it away, I get that impression. So I'm left uh, with the fingerprint impression. And I can use that for comparison. They are looking for clues that will tell them whether this was an accident or a homicide. In a case like this, the tiniest clue can take the investigation in a whole new direction. What has appeared to be just an accident can suddenly turn into a cold-blooded murder. Uh, she had a little bit of liquid coming out of her mouth, which is very common in uh, all drowning cases because that's the, norm the normal process of the uh, body getting rid of the liquid. No pulmon dans une noyade. When a person drowns, there is moisture in the lungs. Some of it may come from the water they drowned in, but some also comes from their own body. The blood draws it into the lungs because of the lack of oxygen. That moisture is rich in proteins because there are a lot of proteins in the blood, and some of them will cross into the lungs. Those proteins get mixed with the air. So when you press the lungs, foam comes out. You see that foam in the respiratory tract, but even before you begin the autopsy, often there is a big mushroom of foam around the nose and the mouth. Before long, Weber and the coroner begin to notice details that arouse their suspicions. We started to see things like we had uh, two different glasses within the bathroom itself that had uh, alcohol in it. And I started to make other observations within the tub itself. It was six inches of water depth within the tub. Um, so with the body in there, it would have obviously displaced, um, but the, uh, the water had cooled down to air temperature. So I would expect in a normal situation, if she, it had been a normal bath, that the water would have been warmer. The water temperature will help determine the time of death. It's just a matter of process. Whenever you're dealing with a drowning, a water sample should always be taken at that time, and so that's what I did there. But also in the bottom of the tub, there was a granular material, and that appeared to be either vomitous or uh, fecal matter um, that had just mixed in with the water. This was not collected at that time because we were still in that process of trying to determine what sort of death that we had. So that was left in there because if something suspicious had come out of the post-mortem examination, I knew that we would be returning to the home under a criminal code warrant and we could grab that at that time. The mother's body shows no signs of struggle and no evidence of foul play can be found. But the investigators still consider this a suspicious death. We were hoping that something would come out of the uh, post-mortem examination that would lead us to conclude one way or the other. The house is sealed off until after the autopsy. Police officers are posted to ensure that no one can enter the home and that all potential evidence remains intact. So far, everything seems to point to an accidental drowning. But in cases such as this, the final determination cannot be made until the autopsy has been completed. It is often the pathologist who finds evidence of foul play. Mississauga, Ontario. A woman is discovered in her bathtub by her 15 and 16 year old daughters. The investigators are very suspicious since bathtub drownings are extremely rare. An autopsy is ordered to determine the cause of death. 
Back in his office, Bernie Weber prepares his report. It will be used by the pathologist at the autopsy the following day. He compares the victim's fingerprints to those in the RCMP database to confirm her identity. I wanted to ensure that she was in fact the lady that we thought she was. I was able to pull the uh, fingerprints, I made that comparison, and then I subsequently notified the coroner, identified this lady, as well as the officer in charge. The following day, Dr. Timothy Feltis prepares for the autopsy. I've done about almost 4,000 medical legal cases over my career. Drowning actually is still not that common. Um, I've probably done perhaps maybe 25 drownings, and I've done maybe six or seven that have occurred in a bathtub. From a forensic pathology point of view, any death in a bathtub is highly suspicious. It's unusual for people to die in a bathtub full of water. Automatically, we treated this as a homicide right from the get-go. A homicide autopsy in this case, with a death in water, meant that we had to do some very specific things. We'll take blood samples that will be used for toxicology. We'll take urine samples that'll be used for toxicology. We also take a sample of stomach contents. Um, that's kind of a backup in this case. We don't usually use uh, the stomach contents all the time, and it is submitted to the Center for Forensic Science. In this case, we also took an extra sample of blood and took it up to our pathology lab and ran it for alcohol. Often when people die in a bathtub, they may be strangled. So that means we have to do what's called a dry neck dissection, whereby we remove the chest and abdominal organs and the brain before we even go near the neck. That is so that we decrease any chance of introducing artifactual blood into the neck by removing those organs. Secondly, we would obviously make a very, very detailed search of that body for any evidence of trauma including bruising, scratches, abrasions, etc. What we're seeing is blood vessels deep down that have ruptured, so blood has collected there. Through the skin, we see the bluish or reddish area. The medical term is ecchymosis, but in everyday language, we call it a bruise. But if the area where there is bleeding is very small or very deep, or if the skin is very dark, sometimes the injuries aren't visible. So as a precaution, we open all the tissue in the back and the back of the legs to see whether there are any injuries we have missed. The other thing that's important in this case to realize is that this woman who died was considered to be an alcoholic. Often, in alcoholic people, we will see evidence of bruising from various falls. What's interesting in this case is that there are no old bruises on this woman's body. Now, that doesn't mean that she isn't an alcoholic. She may be what are called a careful drunk. So I would have expected in this case that uh, if there's a long history of alcoholism that we might have seen evidence of previous falls with some bruising. That was not evident in this case at all. The results of the blood analysis have returned from the lab. We immediately during the course of the autopsy, knew that this woman had a significantly elevated blood alcohol level in the range of 400 milligrams per 100 mLs. That is a potentially fatal level of alcohol. Levels of only 325 milligrams per 100 milliliters can be fatal to an average person. Now, somebody who's a chronic alcoholic might be very much different, but it's certainly a level under which somebody might pass out in a bathtub and accidentally drown. If you've taken enough alcohol and it depresses your central nervous system, it might suppress the cough response you have to get that water out of your lungs. And so that you can take the water in, the water just flows in a lot more easily than it would if you weren't inebriated with alcohol. Any death in a bathtub has to be suspicious. All the findings were was we had this high level of alcohol in a relatively young woman who
who had signs of freshwater drowning and no evidence of trauma. We didn't have any evidence that directly pointed to a homicide. You need absolute proof. And in terms of the autopsy, there wasn't any. The coroner compares the autopsy results with his own observations and the testimony of the victim's daughters. He concludes that the cause of death was accidental drowning due to excessive alcohol consumption. Peel District Police close the file. The sister's aunt becomes their legal guardian. The girls inherit nearly $200,000 from their mother's life insurance policy. However, 11 months later, a surprising piece of evidence is brought to the attention of the Peel police, and the case is reopened. In Mississauga, Ontario, a woman is discovered drowned in her bathtub. Her teenage daughters find her body and call the police. Investigators are very suspicious because bathtub drownings are extremely rare. A full investigation, autopsy, and toxicology are carried out. The coroner concludes that it's an accidental drowning due to toxic levels of alcohol, and the case is closed. Eleven months later, a teenage boy contacts the police with surprising information about the bathtub drowning. This individual received some information from uh, the older of the two sisters. He became aware of certain information and that the mother had actually been uh, murdered uh, or forcibly drowned in the bathtub of the residence. Brent Magnus must first prove that the young man is telling the truth. I discussed it uh, with a Crown attorney because initially uh, when this information came forward through the friend, I realized that we would uh, have to go to an authorization to intercept uh, communications in order to corroborate uh, what this friend was telling us. The police examine the young man's computer. They find online conversations between him and the older sister that are very disturbing. He was providing us information that uh, only uh, the girls uh, would be privy to and that they had uh, actually uh, murdered their mother. The case is reopened and becomes a criminal investigation. The police begin to plan an undercover operation with the young man playing the lead role. Even though he has been friends with the sisters for many years, this operation could put his life at risk. He had been a longtime friend of the girls. Uh, both families growing up were fairly close. The police provide the young man with a car wired with audio and video recording equipment. He acted pretty much in a capacity as an agent for the police and through some guidance with a agent handler was able to uh, meet with the girls and again engage both girls in conversation relating to the murder. During the next four weeks, the young informant records many incriminating conversations with the sisters. He went out to meet uh, the older of the two sisters. He obtained a statement from her with respect to the murders and it was obvious from reviewing and transcribing that entire intercept that the older sister and possibly the younger sister were definitely involved in the murder of their mother. The first intercepted conversation is chilling. The older sister openly reveals details of the murder that they had been planning for months. I think initially uh, you don't want to believe that a 15 and 16 year old would uh, murder a parent, uh, and especially their mother. I mean, the videotape that the police set up was brilliant because these girls had no idea they were being videotaped. In fact, 
At one point, the, I think it's the older girl, she gets into the car and the first thing she says to their friend is, uh, I'm not being videotaped, am I? The sisters came from a broken home. For many years, their mother had been turning to alcohol to deaden the pain of two failed marriages. They were able to use the mother's weaknesses against her, which was uh, uh, the re recent relationship breakup uh, with her boyfriend. When this occurred, she would uh, consume alcohol. Over the course of a few weeks, the young informant meets the sisters four times. The meetings produce many hours of recordings and dozens of leads that must be followed up. One startling discovery comes out in the first recording. The girls had given their mother deadly cocktails of vodka and Tylenol-3, a potent painkiller containing high levels of codeine. We realized uh, we should do a toxicology test looking specifically for codeine. A warrant is issued to release the blood and urine samples taken from the mother a year earlier. A uh, full analysis on uh, the samples and relayed to us that uh, the mother had a abnormal amount of codeine in her system at the time of her death. The investigators have the proof they need. The next step is to plan how to arrest the sisters and their accomplices. I had uh, officers assigned to find out uh, what schools they went to and any other background information we could dig up on them. The police are concerned that news of the arrests will spread quickly through the community. They're afraid the accomplices might have the opportunity to consolidate their alibis. Because the younger generation of uh, people uh, are in communication with one another more readily through cell phones, uh, through Blackberries, internet, it wouldn't take a, a very long period of time for individuals to realize that the girls were uh, arrested. It would be difficult to prevent accomplices from communicating online and covering up important information. The investigators had to come up with a fail-safe strategy. In Mississauga, Ontario, two teenage girls report that their mother has drowned at home in the bathtub. At the time, it is determined that the death was due to excessive alcohol intoxication and it's ruled accidental. The case is closed. One year later, the police received disturbing information suggesting the death was not an accident. With the help of an informant, the police obtain enough evidence to trap the two teenage killers. On January 21st at 7 a.m., the police serve warrants for the arrest of the two sisters for the murder of their mother. The sisters are taken into custody, still dressed in their pajamas. They were brought into uh, the homicide area of uh, Peel Regional Police. They were uh, obviously separated. Uh, we did not want them talking or influencing each other uh, during that process. I had officers obtain specific clothing for them so that it would be addressed appropriately. They both declined to uh, wear anything but uh, the pajamas that they were wearing when they were arrested. At the same time, I had approximately 50 to 55 officers that were out involved in the execution of the search warrant at the residence, uh, searching uh, the residence. And I had identified approximately 45 other individuals that I needed interviewed within a very short period of time. Anybody I thought uh, could provide us information on the girls or the murder of the mother. And I had to keep in the back of my mind to have the girls' uh, family uh, interviewed first. The conversations intercepted by the informant show that the girls had been speaking openly with their friends about the crime that they had committed. Young people who commit this type of crime and brag about it afterwards face a dilemma. Uh, on the one hand, 
they want to prove that they are capable of action, that they're not all talk. Uh, but on the other hand, the more they talk about it, the more they risk getting caught. Detective Magnus wanted to make sure he was able to question the immediate family members before the two accused could talk to them. He had to ensure that a lawyer was present when the two girls were being interrogated. They were given the opportunity to speak with counsel uh, almost immediately. Any other adult or family member that they uh, would feel confident in speaking with, and they were uh, given the opportunity to have those individuals present with them during uh, any interview that would take place. Right from the start, both sisters denied any involvement in their mother's death. But it soon becomes apparent to the police that the older sister is extremely nervous. After several hours of questioning, she finally breaks down in tears. She admits to her role in the murder and describes it in detail. Then, remarkably, she curls up on the floor and falls asleep. That's not uncommon. Uh, I've been involved in uh, several uh, arrests uh, where individuals have an adrenaline dump or some type of uh, change physically that once they uh, have been arrested, uh, they, uh, for some reason, uh, fall asleep. But the younger sister continues to deny any involvement in her mother's drowning. No, after several hours of uh, speaking with her, she did not uh, provide uh, any information uh, to police. However, uh, the two girls wanted to speak with one another. I made the decision to allow that to happen, uh, and they did speak to one another about the uh, murder. They put the two girls together, and they came up with a scheme about how they were going to pretend it was all a big joke they were putting on their friend, and. Uh, and that's the story they're going to tell the police. So they come back into the rooms again, and she says, well, can you, can you be in trouble for lying to police? And, and the officer says, well, what do you mean lying? He says, well, I didn't kill my mother. I was just lying to you. The older sister's retraction leaves the investigators with just one promising lead. The logs of the online chat stored on the girl's computer hard drives. Joe Colson from the Technological Crime Unit examines the computers. They're taken back to the uh, Technological Crime Lab and the computers themselves are physically taken apart, at which time we forensically image the hard drive. Basically, we copy the drive from start to finish. Every bit is copied. Um, we do it in such a way that we can prove that the image that we have taken is identical to the original computer and we do all our work from the forensic copy of that drive. When you delete something from your computer, uh, that file pretty much in its entirety um, is still resident on that computer. A typical user will go in and say, okay, I should delete that now. As far as the chat goes, you can physically go in and delete that chat. But again, with the software programs that we use, sometimes we can, we can recover that. As Colson recovers the files, he begins to piece together the girl's sinister story. And it's not exactly what the investigators had expected. These, these two girls were brilliant kids. Uh, one of the, uh, their guidance counselors said that he, they were the most uh, intelligent kids that he'd ever seen in 30 years of teaching. But he said their best quality was their ability to manipulate people. Their online chats paint a picture of an unhappy family life. Their mother had been in two difficult relationships with abusive men. They accused their mother of spending more money on alcohol than on their well-being. They began to fantasize about a better life without their mother. Within a very short period of time, their entire lifestyle started to change. Uh, around the time that they came up with the plan, they started hanging out with different people. 
than they used to. They started skipping school, uh, started using uh, drugs and alcohol. I realized uh, after examining uh, some of the intercepts that this uh, was actually not a spur of the moment uh, homicide or murder, uh, that this was uh, planned and calculated, uh, researched by both individuals. The mother, uh, unbeknownst to the girls, was saving money for them, providing them uh, a good uh, home life and working several jobs to provide that. Uh, the girls didn't recognize that. Once the girls sat down and uh, came up with the idea of killing their mother for insurance uh, monies, uh, I believe they hatched the plan through research and talking with some friends. Probably the most important part of the analysis on this case was uh, keywords and the analysis of, of keyword hits on these drives. The investigators used specially designed software to help them sift through the enormous volume of data. All of their conversations were being logged on the computer. I don't know whether they knew it was logged or not, but it was being logged on their computer. The first hit that we got was alcohol effects and Tylenol. And that was sort of that first glimpse. When I found that first shred of evidence, that first smoking gun, there was the adrenaline. It was like, there it is. I came up with the idea of uh, getting her intoxicated and providing her pills to uh, incapacitate her. They actually did research into the amount of alcohol, uh, the amount of Tylenol or codeine and its effects mixed with alcohol. Uh, and the amount of time necessary to uh, drown a person or hold them underwater to uh, facilitate a murder. The police recover information that proves the girls had been actively planning their mother's murder for months. But the two sisters had not acted alone. We were able to show that the girls were actually uh, chatting with this particular individual and uh, that he uh, was willing to be an alibi for the two girls. He actually did show up the night uh, of the murder uh, at a local restaurant to act as an alibi. The young accomplice was also a lifeguard. He was well aware of how easy it is to drown someone. He provided uh, the one sister with uh, Tylenol uh, pills sufficient enough to uh, incapacitate the mother along with the alcohol. For an entire year, the sisters have managed to get away with the perfect crime. Now the time has come for the investigators to build the perfect prosecution. Southern Ontario is shocked by the news that a one-year-old accidental drowning case has been escalated to murder. The accused are two teenage sisters from Mississauga. They are arrested and charged with drowning their mother. After months in a detention center, the two sisters are accompanied by their lawyers to their bail hearing. Surprisingly, they are still wearing their pajamas. I've covered you know, hundreds and hundreds of cases the last 10, 15 covering crime, and, and I'd never ever seen two girls so young show up in court dressed in their pajamas, especially two girls who were allegedly uh, arrested for killing their mother. And I thought, what, what's going on here? Their immediate family and circle of friends believe the police have made a terrible mistake. In fact, during the bail hearing, uh, there was laughter throughout the whole courtroom. The father didn't believe it, the, the aunt certainly didn't believe it, their cousins thought it was a big joke. After their hearing, their lawyers talked to the media. Their lawyers came out and said that, you know, these poor girls were wrestled out of bed and they weren't allowed to dress and the, the cops did this and, and uh, it's just a terrible story. And, and uh, of course, what we didn't know at the time was the girls lived in their pajamas, refused to get dressed and had spent the, the better part of the day before just sparring with uh, seasoned interviewers about what happened. Masters of manipulation, the sisters begin to sway public opinion using their lawyers, family, and friends. There was a lot of media coverage. You know, young girls killing their mother, how could that happen? Let's feel sorry, it must have been their lifestyle. Uh, the mother must have been abusive. So 
them four months after their arrest. They were given bail with specific conditions placed on them by the judge. And uh, one of those conditions was being uh, to remain within the residence where they were residing, uh, which was the aunt's house. The girls are released from the detention center and placed under house arrest with their aunt until the trial. It just meant that they, they weren't free to do anything they wanted. I mean, they could go to school if they could have. They could have gone to doctor appointments. They could go to work if they wanted. They just had to be with uh, somebody chaperoning them. Some of the computers were given back to uh, the family. Uh, we actually obtained a lot of the uh, evidence from a computer that had been brought with them from their previous residence. The sisters continue their deception. The family still believes the girls are innocent, but their online chats tell a completely different story. And they spend that entire year um, living at the aunt's house. And this is the aunt whose sister they have killed. And everybody supports them. Um, they think the police have made a terrible mistake. With the same computers they use to hatch their diabolical plan, the sisters continue their online chats and brag about how they've been able to fool everyone. When the investigation is complete, the sisters' cruel, clever plan is finally brought to light. While the sisters are under house arrest, the logs of their previous online chats are examined with a fine-tooth comb. Investigators are then able to piece together a detailed timeline of the events that led up to the murder. The evidence clearly proves that the sisters had planned to kill their mother in cold blood. It's our belief that the girls uh, uh, poured drinks for the mother, provided her pills, which was not abnormal for them to do that. A mixture of alcohol and codeine from the Tylenol-3 soon puts their mother in an almost unconscious state. is heavily sedated. The sisters fill the tub and prepare the bathroom. They help their mother up the stairs, taking great care that she doesn't fall and bruise herself. The older sister helps her mother climb into the tub. Telephone and computer records proved that the sisters were communicating with their friends as they prepared to drown their mother. The older sister puts on latex gloves, then holds her mother's head under 15 centimeters of water until she stops breathing. sisters rush out of the house. In order to establish an alibi, they have arranged to meet a girlfriend and their accomplice, the lifeguard, at a local restaurant. 
After dinner, they return home and stage their 911 call. The older sister makes the call. The younger sister is in the background. The older sister sounds like she is uh, upset. Uh, but when you review that with uh, other evidence in the case, you realize that uh, she was uh, play acting. 911 operators ask the girls to provide the mother assistance if they found her just drowned in the tub. When police first responded, there was some evidence of rigidity, rigor mortis, and uh, lividity, which would indicate that it had transpired several hours prior to the girls calling 911. One year after their arrest, the trial begins. They become known as the Bathtub Sisters. People ask me, well, was this a hard trial to sit through? And, and you must have been you know, aghast by all this. Every day, uh, myself and other reporters that covered it couldn't wait to get to the courtroom because we just couldn't wait to find out what was going to come next. The Crown attorneys uh, would say, if you, you know, if you thought this was good, stay tuned. The sisters have two motives for their crime. One is to escape from an abusive home life and an alcoholic parent. The other is just plain greed. They know their mother has a life insurance policy worth nearly $200,000. That's what makes this whole thing bizarre, chilling, disturbing. Yeah. There were three close friends who knew it was going to happen beforehand, knew afterwards. Nobody ever goes to their parents, nobody goes to police, nobody goes to any authority figure whatsoever. And, and I think during that whole year they got away with it. There had to be hundreds of kids in two different high schools that either suspected they had killed their mother or knew firsthand they had done it. Uh, but nobody ever tells anybody. Their accomplices eventually testify against the girls and help to convict them. The young male accomplice is also arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. As the trial progresses, the police continue to bring forward new evidence found on the seized computers. The technical evidence added so much validity and so much weight to these um, other witnesses' statements uh, because we were able to corroborate what these witnesses were saying. The digital evidence in this particular case really became the crux of the case. To my knowledge, this is probably one of the, um, the foremost technical investigations that took place uh, in this country at that time. After a trial lasting several weeks, Justice Bruce Duncan hands down his decision. Their mother is obviously... He says the two defendants set out to commit the perfect crime, but instead they created the perfect prosecution. The case against them is overwhelming. He declares that this is the strongest case he's ever seen in over 30 years of prosecuting and judging criminal cases. He finds the defendants guilty of first degree murder. They were convicted as youth under the Youth Criminal Justice Act. It meant that they, all they could serve was a maximum of 10 years. First degree murder, that's the most you can serve can only serve a maximum of six years in custody. The rest can be served in a halfway house, even in their own house under house arrest eventually. When they get released after that 10 year period is up, they can go anywhere in Canada. They don't really need to get new names because nobody will know their names. But for the average public, they'll always be known as the bathtub girls. I feel strongly that everybody came to the same uh, conclusion that these two girls were uh, evil. The horrific thing about this is that these were 15 and 16 year old kids and they almost got away with the perfect crime. The deadly power of water was used to cover up an almost perfect crime. The mother's drowning would have gone unpunished had it not been for one person following his conscience. Once again, water would have been a ruthless accomplice, silent perfect.